Right? I don't have to do anything to turn the mic on. It's live. Okay. Constant live. <laughs> you can give it a tap for sure. Everybody get a program? Oh, okay. Right. 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 In doing what? In the program to everybody? No, no, no. This chair, you have no idea. How are you? Good, and you? Good to see you. How's everything? Okay. I love the false beer. Big days, a big couple days. Yeah. You know, no, pre no pressure for tomorrow, okay? No over yet. They taped one up there for you. Oh, I can't look. Hey, Tara, how are you? How's everything? Mayor Perry?
Folks, we'll be underway in just a second. It's hard to herd all these people up here. We got a glorious day, don't we? For this great celebration. And I welcome all of you. We'll have a proper welcome in just a minute. Welcome, everybody. Color Guard, Parade the Colors. Detail. Oh. Right. Wait. Oh. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America.
Color guard, retire the colors. Left, right. Forward, mark. Left, 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 This gathering may be seated. As the orchestra and chorus perform the Armed Forces Medley, we invite those of you in the audience who have served or who are currently serving to please stand and join in as your song is presented. United States Coast Guard. Salute to all service members, all branches. That was fantastic, wasn't it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 20 years ago, four commercial aircraft took off from Boston, Newark, and Washington. They took off fully loaded with men, women, and children, all innocent 
and all soon to die. These aircraft were targeted at the World Trade Centers in New York, the Pentagon, and likely the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Three found their mark. No American alive old enough to remember will ever forget exactly where they were that day. Amen? Amen. We all remember what we were doing, exactly who we were with at the moment when we watched those aircraft dive into the World Trade Towers on what was until then a beautiful fall morning in New York City. Once the buildings had collapsed and the immensity of the attack began to register, most of us had no idea what to do or where to turn. As a nation, we were scared, maybe as we had never been scared for generations. Americans returned to church and mass, seeking understanding, God's help and protection. Once that we began to absorb the immensity of that terrible attack, American moral outrage, American patriot soared. It asserted itself, almost if collective memory and behavior is genetic, as we remembered that strong men and women in every generation had stepped forward to protect the nation when the need was dire. And you will all remember how god-awful dire the need was then. There was, however, a small segment of America that made a very different choice that day. Actions the rest of America stood in awe of in 9-11 and every day since. The first were our fire fires and our police. Their ranks decimated on that day as they ran towards, not away from danger, in the imminence of death. They were doing what they had sworn to do, to protect and to serve, and they went to their graves having fulfilled that sacred oath. Then there was the armed forces, so many represented here today. Brave men and women volunteered in droves, and they volunteered for one reason and one reason alone, because of that terrible assault on our way of life committed by 19 men with an extremist ideology based in their faith. The commitment of the military was to protect the nation, swearing a solemn oath to do so to their very deaths. You know, it has always bothered me and it strikes me that the media often talks about, some of the media, <laughs> often talks about 9-11 as a tragedy. It wasn't a tragedy, it was an atrocity. Why do we still call 9-11 a tragedy? Because we as a people don't understand evil. Flood, fires, COVID, plagues are tragedies. Cancer's a tragedy. Fighting against cancer with all our might and losing someone in our families is a tragedy. But 9-11 was no tragedy. It was an atrocity, and it was meticulously planned. It was a planned act of human evil by deeply misguided and evil men. While violence against another person is a sin, it's, it's sometimes justified and necessary. Evil must be confronted in every generation and sometimes killed for good to survive and flourish. If we, however, cannot recognize evil, how can we fight it? How many years couldn't we name that evil? I remember Leon Klinghoffer being thrown off the deck of the Achilles Laurel. I remember the attack on the Israeli athletes in the 1972 Olympics in Munich. I remember small craft floating in the direction of the USS Cole and blowing a, high, a hole in it taking along brave American sailors. How many acts of evil did we witness before we could put a name to it? On 9-11, we put a name to it. Islamic terrorism, Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic supremacy. And there's no getting away from that truth, though many would have us talk in softer terms. If we can't recognize evil, how can we fight it? If we can't name it, how can we fight it? The sad truth is that so many Americans are clueless about evil. And so they have no idea how to pro 
properly memorialize those who were slaughtered on 9-11. And the most fitting memorial for those who were so cruelly murdered in the air and on the ground is never to forget and secondly, to relentlessly strike back at our enemies, wherever they are, until they're nothing but dust and ashes. We'll let God deal with them then. These men and women who are represented by a single flag in the field of flags did not die in vain. And that's what I wanted to say to you. But they died confronting the greatest evil of our generation. They died in the confrontation of evil so that good might flourish, not only here in America, but in the whole world. And you know something? That's the American way. We fight not just for ourselves, but everybody. And we fight hard. And I'm saddened that our military leaders have become politically correct, that our government is gutless in so many cases and didn't unleash our military to do the job that you would have done in this generation. When future generations ask why America is still free in the heyday of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and their terrorist allies, when their days are counted in days rather than in centuries, our hometown heroes, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our coast guardsmen and Marines can say, because of people like me who risked all to protect millions and who will never know my name. That's why we're here today, my friends, and I welcome all of you to Westminster's 12th annual Field of Flag ceremony, honoring the 7,053 military service members who died in Iraq and Afghanistan in the so-called War on Terror. We're joined on this special occasion by a whole bunch of special people that I'd like to acknowledge. First, I'd like to welcome the wives and the family of our guest speakers today, Jennifer Hegseth and Pham. Really going crazy during the uh, Army tribute. That was fun to watch. U.S. Army. Also want, to went, met, also want to welcome Krista Callahan, wife of Commander and Captain Edward Callahan. Also the wife of last year's keynote speaker, Miss Chrissy D'Amata. Welcome, Chrissy. We're happy to welcome all those who join us from Naval Weapons Station Earl today. And also welcome to the dais to last year's keynote speaker, Sergeant Darrell. I'm not sure I have your title correct, sir. Your rank. Sergeant, I do have it right. There are so many letters in your bio, I couldn't interpret them, it was like code. Sergeant Daryl D'Amata, who served. He served in more police places than most human beings should. In operations, Joint Guard, Iraqi Freedom, and Enduring Freedom, with a total of five deployments. He's joined up here today by his friend, Patty Malloy, the proud mother of a Marine who died from PTSD consequences. Um, Patty Malloy has become a dear friend and she's the founder of an organization called Angel Warriors here in town that raises money to buy service dogs for returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. To this point, Patty, how many? 10 at about 15 grand a piece. So we t today we talk about the 7,053 flags, but over 32,000 veterans were wounded in Iraq. I don't know the Allied Forces number, it's massive. But so many of our returning service members come home damaged, not the same as they were when they left and today I want to recognize uh, any veterans who might be joining us today with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and it hits close to home. We had Major Sean Keel from Middletown North High School who served five deployments. Uh, I lost my slip here. Four tours, four tours, three in Iraq, one in Afghanistan, U.S. Marine. Sean was an extraordinary warrior, yet he's not counted 
among the 7,053 is not counted as a casualty of war because he died from PTSD consequences and complications. That's not right. And we need to redefine that. We also recognize today Patty's son, Private Michael Breen, U.S. Marines. One tour, came home, wasn't right, struggling. And was he North or CBA? CBA? Okay, she knows what I mean. CBA. Also Private James Veth, U.S. Marines. One tour, came home, PTSD problems. Couldn't survive those. These brave men, and women served honorably and deserve to be acknowledged and to be counted among the casualties of this war. And that's the problem. Let's redefine that. Uh, you people, especially in the military and their families. I have asked um, Major Keel's family to place one flag in the field representing all those who may be here today and throughout the United States struggling with PTSD and TBI. So our field has 7,054. That's an exact number, by the way. We were careful in counting and putting them out, and we're proud of that. There's also 15 deer in this field every night that I have to chase out. I'm glad the ceremony's here. Honest to God. <clears throat> also joining us on the dais today are dedicated members of the Middletown Township Committee, newly elected committee wooden, committee woman Kim Kraft, <laughs> committeeman and deputy mayor Rick Heibel, Ryan Clark, and I don't think Kevin Settenbrino made it, but he's with us in spirit. Thank you to Middletown. Police Chief Craig Weber, Deputy Chief Kaiser, and Stefanski for leading the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. Just to give you an idea what the police do, the chief was out. There was a shooting in Long Branch last night. I don't know if you heard about it. He was there to 6 a.m. this morning, and uh, he's here today. That's commitment, and Chief, we appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Sean Purcell. You're the only guy who followed uh, the pledge was supposed to happen down there. Chief's sleepy. It was supposed to happen down there. Sean was up. He was ready to roll. So thank you for being here. Eagle Scout from Troop 122. <laughs> Our thanks to the Brookdale Concordia Corral, who sang so beautifully at both the 9-11 service at the train station, as well as here under the capable leadership of Director John Baum. Thank you for being here. Mayor Toey Perry's behind me over my left shoulder, Middletown's young, intelligent, and energetic mayor. Yeah. As well as the new Monmouth County surrogate, Maureen Raish. Representing the 13th Legislative District, New Jersey, Assemblyman Jerry Scharfenberger is with us. Jerry has been here for every single community event that I have done in my 15 years here, but I have to say this, which is most impressive. He fills a dual role, in, and probably more, as both a professor at Monmouth University and as a state legislator, but in the latter role, he often stands for common sense and decency against zany ideas that come from the university. Tearing down statues, removing historical stuff. Jerry's strong, and he stands against that. I was going to say other stuff, but I think I'll leave it there. Okay. I still like my Our first speaker today is Captain Edward Callahan. He wasn't originally on the program, but I heard him speak at 9 11. I said, that guy's hot stuff. I got to get him in here. <laughs> so he's locked and loaded. He's got some things to say about the service of our military today. And we're joined by his lovely wife, Krista, with a K. Uh, <laughs> He corrected me last night. And I, I appreciate it. In a late, I was here to 10 o'clock, chasing the deer out and everything else. Our keynote speaker today is Pete Hegseth. Uh, you know him. Thank you. 
You know him from Fox News, handsome stud, <laughs> author of two books, but more importantly, U.S. Army officer and warrior who shared the battlefield, I think, with Daryl in Fallujah, and those guys got to catch up afterwards. I know both were involved in the battle of Fallujah, Iraq. Last, and I mean this sincerely, I want to welcome Father Dan Hesco from St. Catharines in North Middletown, is that right? Or is it Kingsburg? He's co-presiding with me at this ceremony today. You know, back in the movie, there was a movie, uh, and there was a character in the movie who was called the Jewel of the Nile. Father Hesco has been a treasure and a jewel to the people of his parish and this community for a long, long time. He's the jewel of Jesus Christ, and uh, he's an intelligent, compassionate, understanding, morally courageous, and righteous man. And I'm lucky to have him, and I need his uh, strength at my side. Father Hesker, welcome to you, sir. I know you're wishing I'm done. I don't know if I am. I'm going to quit either way and invite Father Hesco to offer the invocation. Let us pause for just a moment and ask God's blessing upon all of us gathered here this afternoon and upon all that we do. We listen to the words of the book of, Hebrew, uh, the book of Proverbs that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you would direct our path. We pray that you would give us the gift of peace, the gift of, the gift of justice, the gift of goodness within our land, within our people. But we recognize that with all your gifts, there comes a responsibility. But peace comes upon a people of peace. But the gift of blessing come upon a people who are obedient to your word. And so we pray that you would bend our wills and bend our hearts, that in all things we might truly acknowledge you and we pray, God, for your blessing upon all these people who have gathered the day, especially our veterans and those we remember who paid that ultimate price, not only in just our recent wars, but going all the way back, even farmers in this area who put down their plows and took up muskets uh, to go and fight, even in uh, the battlefields in Freehold. And so we pray your blessing, Lord, upon all that we do this day, we pray that you would keep the memory of those valiant men and women ever burning in our hearts. Most importantly, we pray that you would keep your word in our heart, that we might obey you and we might follow you, and that the blessing of peace may descend upon a people of peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated, everybody. Okay, let's get relaxed here, okay? Our first speaker is the commander of the base at uh, Earl. We're lucky to have him today, and I'm uh, happy to introduce Captain Edward Callahan. You always got to have somebody who has to adjust the mic to give you that timely pause, and I'm that person. Uh, I tell you, when I look out there, first thing I see is patriotic, patriotism. But I had this nice long introductory thing said. It's going to start off. Thank you, Reverend Hyde, for that wonderful introduction. I was going to talk about all these dignitaries and all that. But I think everything's been well said because actually the real dignitaries are all of you in the in the crowd today, and especially our Gold Star family. So I'm just going to get right into what I really want to say. First of all, I am truly honored and humbled to stand before you today not in my role as the commanding officer or Naval Weapons Station Earl, or in my role as a 38 year active duty service member, but as a voice and a presence representing now 7,054 servicemen and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice in service to our nation, which included protecting everyone here today. But I could not, thank you, but I could not be more proud and grateful as a military service member and a citizen of our great nation for this vision that was started by the Westminster Presbyterian Church, which I thought was 20 years ago, I think the actual ideal came about, and they've done this for 12 years annually, because this gives us all a visual opportunity 
to pause our lives in order to understand the magnitude of selfless service. Honor and pay respect to 7,054 heroes represented by the individual flags planted in the field to our side. But even more importantly than that, these symbols of life given for others need to be understood, honored, respected, not only by us that wear a uniform, but by you, the citizens of our great nation that they serve. As we remember, mourn our sacred fallen and honor their sacrifice today. We are duty bound yet to heed a higher calling. It is so easy to mark the names of those heroes who you don't even know on a document and on a monument. But it seems so much more difficult for people to just stop and take the time to learn about these strangers who gave their life so that we could enjoy the comforts of our lives. So it is critically important that we mark their names in our hearts, in our minds, and be eternally grateful to them for their sacrifice. Yet, I'm here to tell you, those actions alone are not nearly enough. To truly honor our nation's heroes, we must never forget what they did for our needs. And we must look to those they left behind, their families, and see to their needs. Well, I'm sure many of you can set, recognize the sacrifice made by a wife, husband, son, daughter, mother and father of these 7,054 souls. How many of you truly understand the level of service the military family member gives to their, this nation on behalf of their service member? While these uniformed service members willingly raise their right hand and swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, their family members did not, yet they still served. They served by supporting their loved one in their military career. They served by ensuring their loved one was able to give more of themselves to their service than to their family. They served when their loved one packed their bags and went off to war. They continue to serve now, each and every day, as they deal with, deal with and feel the loss of their loved one who never returned. They serve as they raise their family, left behind by a wife, husband, son or daughter, who gave everything, including their lives, in service to this nation. Those of us who have served and still serve in the military know and honor the sacrifices every day. We hold our wives, husbands, children, and parents in awe as they navigate the difficult world of being a military family member. We know what they stand ready for to give up and we love them more, especially for that. That is why we have the Military Gold Star Family Program and my coordinator, Katrina Rush, is sitting right here because she finds it equally as important to make sure that she can reach out and touch anybody that needs her service there. So, Katrina, thank you for coming. <laughs> this program is, is, is crucial role in supporting our Gold Star families, that is, those families of the Sacred Fallen. But it also emboldens all of us who wear the uniform to make the choice to serve every day knowing that if the worst were to occur, our nation would be there to take care of our family. That is a duty and an honor that we in uniform do not take lightly, and we will continue to provide support and care to our Gold Star family members as long as they live. We will never forget them, and we will strive to ensure they know they are always a part of our military family. I'd like to ask all the Gold Star family members, would you please stand up for us to recognize you? Any Gold Star family members in the crowd? If so, please wave your hand and stuff. All right, so in lieu of not having a Gold Star family, sir, you go part of a Gold Star family? I, I don't blame you, it gets, it gets a little long, sometimes I have to stand up too. 
I'll try to shorten it up a little bit. So anyway, but if we had those families here, I would want you to take a look at them and understand that while every flag here in the field represents a service member we've lost, those Gold Star family members represent our opportunity to truly honor the sacrifices. We should never forget those that we lost, but we must never forget the families they left behind. We need to honor them, love them, support them. That is our duty and that is our obligation. Before I turn over the microphone to our keynote speaker, Mr. Pete Hegseth, I would like to conclude my remarks by sharing a very important Navy tradition with you all. Throughout the military, each service has their own way of bidding farewell to their departing or fallen comrades. In the Army and Marine Corps, they hold the final roll call. In the Air Force, they fly the missing man formation. And in the Navy and the Coast Guard, we recite the watch. So I've taken the liberty to adjust this age old poem as a means to honor those 7,054 souls who made the ultimate sacrifice over the last two decades of war. For countless years, these service members stood the watch. While some of us were in our beds at night, they stood the watch. While some of us were in school learning our trade, they stood the watch. Yes, even before some of us were born into this world, these soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guardmen stood the watch. In those years when the storm clouds of war were seen brewing over the horizon history, they stood the watch. Many times they would cast an eye homeward and see their family members standing there, needing their guidance and help, needing that hand to hold on to in those hard times. But they still stood the watch. They stood the watch for many years. They stood the watch so that we, our families, our fellow countrymen could sleep safely and soundly each and every night, knowing that a service member stood the watch. I'd like to ask all my, my folks in uniform to please stand up and face the field of flags. Today, we are here to say to these 7,054 fallen heroes, the watch stands relieved relieved by those you have trained, guided, and led. You stand relieved. We have the watch. Hand salute. Ready, two. You may take your seats. So may God bless the families and souls of all our fallen comrades. May God bless all of you here today for recognizing these sacrifices, honoring and paying respect to these fallen heroes. May God bless our military for always standing the watch so that we can enjoy our American way of life. And may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. That sound overhead is a friendly drone. <laughs> so if you hear it, look up, smile. We want to see you. Uh, we're taping this, and it's going to be on our website. I'm pleased and honored to introduce to this audience Pete Hegseth, who uh, came directly from the show this morning to do this. Uh, I'm often amazed at the commitment level of our officers, of our people in public service, and uh, that goes for for Pete and those in media too. Tough schedule. He's here today for us. And again, uh, you know, I've never let anybody but a, a military person speak at this microphone at this service. And uh, that's how I think of Pete Hegseth first. Major, 
the U.S. Army, served in Iraq and Afghanistan and Guantanamo Bay, served with distinction, two bronze medals. We're honored to have not so much the TV co-host of Fox and Fr Friends Weekend, but a warrior in our presence today as he offers words for us. Well, Pastor, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and the opportunity. And I would just say, thankfully, when we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were always friendly drones. <laughs> and that was always a beautiful sound. And it was the worst sound in the world for the bad guys, because it usually meant a missile was going to greet them soon. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm at home. And I mean that sincerely, looking out at this crowd of patriots. I, I feel like I'm at home, so I should also say to my kids, behave, <laughs> which I say often at home. Uh, but there's, there's a reason they're here. And there's a reason events like this are so important. We say, we say never forget. We say always remember. And then we forget. And then we move on with our lives. And then we miss the opportunities to reinforce the values that we cherish so deeply, but we don't find the time to connect to the next generation. The word for that is, is something like civic ritual, parades, ceremonies, events, 7,054 flags laid bare before our eyes that when you look at represent a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, who will, when you talk about the ultimate sacrifice, and that was so well said by the commander, the ultimate sacrifice of what? Of a wedding, of a birth of a child, of a baptism, of a graduation, of a wedding for their kids. Every single thing that we cherish as citizens of this free and great nation is something that field and generations before us gifted to us. It is a sheer gift of freedom, of patriots willing to give absolutely all of it so that we can live in this wonderful country. And if we don't take a moment to pause and remember and then pass it to the next generation, we will lose it. And I learned it not through the bloodstream. You know, Ronald Reagan once said, the he once said that freedom doesn't pass in the bloodstream. It doesn't move from generation to generation automatically. You have to foster it. Where, did, where was it fostered for me? On a small town in Southern Minnesota called Wanamingo, tiny farming town, a couple hundred people, but they had a big wide main street. My parents both grew up there. They both came from, uh, from that very same small town. And they would take me to every Memorial Day parade. And we would sit on the, uh, on the, on the wide main street of Wanamingo, Minnesota, tree-lined in Nowhereville, Minnesota. And the whole town would come out and, and, and surround that main town. And it was one of these parades where if you blink, you miss it. So, you know, the, the, the one patrol car, the one fire truck, the, the school band, and then the veterans. And I'll never forget the reverence that that town had for those men walking down that street. It was World War II vets, it was Korean War vets, it was Vietnam vets, it was Gulf War vets who had recently come back and actually still fit in their uniforms. But every single member of that town rocketed to their feet and I was a young kid, just like them. I didn't really understand what was going on. My parents would pull me aside and talk to me about it a little bit. I didn't come from a military family. But what I knew is that when those men walked down that street, there was a reverence and a, and a gravity in that town for what they had done. And of course, it was Memorial Day. So it wasn't about the men walking down the street. It was about where they were walking to, which is the Memorial Park in Wanamingo, Minnesota, 
where ultimately there was a ceremony held for the men of that tiny town who never made it home. And when you start to extrapolate that tiny town of Wanamingo and this great town of Middletown and any other across our country, you start to add that up. This field looks a lot bigger and the ultimate sacrifice gets a lot more weighty and you start to understand why it's so special. My parents didn't preach to me to join the military. I actually joined before 9-11, a couple months before, and 9-11 was the ultimate validator. But I remember sitting as a kid watching the veterans salute on that parade route saying, man, they must have done something special. They must have done something worthy. I hope someday I can do something that's worthy, that's, that, that's meaningful and that gives back to this amazing country. And that's why I'm so grateful for an event like this. And what Pastor Joe has done, what the Field of Flag ceremony is, Westminster Presbyterian Church, taking a moment on this Veterans Day weekend to truly recognize, and hopefully a moment to pass to the next generation, how much reverence we truly have. Because a lot of us will say, I hear it all the time, way too often, frankly, because I'm, I'm on TV and People recognize me and they hear about that. So they come up to me and say, I, I want to thank you for your service. And of course, I, I'm grateful and I truly appreciate that. And I think people should continue to do that. You know why? Because underneath a thank you for your service is an understanding and appreciation of what that service means. It's ultimately gratitude. By the way, who were the first people to tell the members of the Iraq and Afghanistan generation, thank you for your service? It was Vietnam veterans. Do we have any Vietnam veterans in the house today? Stand up for me. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your service and welcome home. And the reason why I got thank you for my service is because you never did. And shame on what happened to you over the course of your conflict and the way the country received you home and you welcomed us with open arms. Ceremonies like this are happening because of you. And the pastor asked me to, to talk a little bit about why we serve. I think all of us serve for different reasons, love of country, adventure, patriotism, family tradition, obviously defense of the nation post 9-11, brotherhood. Some of us saw Saving Private Ryan, and it motivates. Whatever it is, got you into uniform because you want to serve this country. But ultimately, when you're in combat, when the bullets are flying, it's a brotherhood. It's a brotherhood of the man to the right and the left of you, the woman to the right of the left of you, standing there with you in that moment. You know you will not let them down. You know the only way you come home when you walk out on patrol is if they have your back and you have theirs. Ultimately, that's the connection in combat on the battlefield that you have. There's no one else to call. There's no one else coming to save you, except for that lovely drone when you hear it. <laughs> Ultimately, it is the brotherhood and the sacrifice and the commitment and the honor of the people next to you on the battlefield. And that's why when coming home, it is so difficult to translate and to relate and to recognize because, and, and that's why I appreciate that the 54th, 7,054th flag was added because those are, those are casualties of conflict. Those are men who came home and grappled with the demons that they had confronted on the battlefield, with the things they did that no one at home is gonna understand. Uh, how do you talk to people who haven't seen that about that. I know I struggled with it. I came back three weeks after being in combat in Iraq. I was sitting in an apartment in Manhattan, surrounded by a city that hated the war that I had just fought and focused on things that uh, I thought were silly and superficial. So I drank a lot, laid on the couch a lot, was not a productive human being. And thankfully I had a support system that came around me and said, there's a next chapter in your life. And that's what I think this group represents. That's what I know groups like yours represent is turning to these men 
and saying, there's another chapter. Your country needs you still. There's a battlefield right here at home that we need you involved in for the very freedoms that you fought for on the battlefield. That legacy must continue. And your commitment to that is needed here at home just as much as it was needed as a response said so well by the pastor to the evil that happened on 9-11, which is exactly what it was. This year's a little bit different and the pastor and I talked about it before uh, this event when we talked on the phone. It's the 12th year this event's gone on and he mentioned that this field over those 12 years has grown from 2,000 flags to 7,000 flags. Thankfully, next year, there, there won't be more. Uh, at one level, there won't be more flags on the field. The wars of this generation at this moment, as declared by our political leaders, have ceased. But that doesn't mean the threat from our enemies have ceased. See, that's the foolish nature of the whole idea that if you just leave the battlefield, the war is over. Of course, we understand the evil ideology that exists behind radical Islam. It ultimately does seek our destruction. It ultimately would uh, like to continue what happened on 9-11. And it ultimately certainly does not believe that the war is over. But that doesn't change the fact that these men did their part. But you can't help but reflect on the way that we retreated from the battlefield in Afghanistan. It was shameful. It was shameful the way our Marines and soldiers were left there to do their very best at the very end. It was shameful the way in which we abandoned our Afghan allies. It was shameful the way we allowed our equipment to fall into the hands of our enemy. It was, it was, a, it was shameful in the way we showed the world what America's limited commitment can look like. Troops in the future will pay the price for the way in which we abandoned that fight in Afghanistan. And I say that not as someone who wants to stay in Afghanistan forever. I wanted to get out of that war just as much as anybody else. I was there in 2011, 2012, saw the writing on the wall of how powerful the Taliban really was. And trust me, they were building an underground network, a shadow government, a, 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 um, a regime of intimidation then that I believed would come to the ultimate end state uh, of, of us eventually leaving, but it didn't have to happen that way. And 13 of those flags represent 13 who were killed at Abbey Gate outside the airfield in Kabul. Killed reaching over a wall, trying to pull people they've never ever met up into freedom as a last gasp chance before the Taliban who were relying on for their security takes over that capital and executes anyone who's ever worked with Americans. That's how it works. There is no Taliban 2.0. And when I was watching that all unfold, some of which live on television, I couldn't help but think about how I felt when the black flag of ISIS flew over towns in Iraq that I had served in as well. Um, it flew over towns like Samara, where I served in Fallujah, Ramadi. And I, I'll never forget getting on the phone with my first sergeant from Iraq with our, with our, with our uh, brigade commander and a couple of other people. We were so incensed, we had no idea what to do. Got on the phone and said, what do we do? Can we form a unit and, and go over there and do something about this? We didn't sacrifice to give the terrain back to an even worse enemy than the one that we deposed. And ultimately after, I mean, the calls were more therapeutic than they were anything else. Thankfully, ISIS was eventually crushed. But what it taught me and what Afghanistan taught me and the reason it resonated so deeply with so many of us is because the legacies of our battlefields matter. They matter a lot. They matter a lot to the men and women who fought for them. They matter a lot to the previous generations who fought to give us a chance to keep fighting, because that's ultimately what this is. The only thing necessary, as the pastor alluded to, Edmund Burke, the only thing necessary for uh, evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. Only utopians, 
Only godless utopians believe that evil will ever be eradicated from the earth in our lifetime until our Lord and Savior returns. Until then, we deal with the evil of sin. Until then, we deal with the reality of evil. And good men and good ideas and free people must and always will have to stand up to defend it. It doesn't stop. History is not over. And the legacies of how we finish wars reverberate to the next generation of how our enemies view us, how our allies view us, and whether or not our military is willing and capable to fight. The pastor mentioned it. None of these men died in vain. Not a single one of them. And I say that fully understanding the wreckage that was left behind, the reality, the geopolitical, the military reality of what we see in Iraq and Afghanistan today. Every single one of them went over there, not because they hate what's in front of them, but because they love what's behind them. They love the most exceptional nation in human history, the most free, the most prosperous, the most just, the most tolerant, the most powerful, the most benevolent nation the world has ever seen. We have plenty of people in our elite class today who love to tear down and decry the United States of America. They are ignorant of the history of the world. They're ignorant of the impossibility of an exceptional project like this, a republic if we can keep it, that was an experiment gifted to us by founders, imperfect men like all of us, who ultimately gave us a chance to live free. And every generation is charged to perpetuate that, some more than others. And I just, I think of one flag out there. His name is Sergeant Carlo Eugenio. He was 29 years old. I never met him. But on October 29th, 2011, he was riding in a rhino bus, which is an up armored bus. Some of you have probably been in them. Uh, on a, on a, in a, in a, being transported from the Kabul airfield to the base that I was on, Camp Julian in Kabul, in a military convoy. He and 12 other Americans, 17 total, were on that rhino bus. When a Taliban suicide bomber with 1,500 pounds of explosives rammed his vehicle into that rhino bus in the middle of that convoy. 17 total killed, 12 Americans killed, four U.S. troops killed. It was the deadliest attack in Kabul. His name was Sergeant Carlo Eugenio from Rancho Camancho, California. He was a sergeant in the 756 Transportation Company. His friends called him Kicks. They said he was a joy to be around. He'd been born in the Philippines, but raised in California. He loved to be outdoors, ride his dirt bike. He was close with his parents. He was closest with his oldest brother, who was his best friend. He had three sisters. And today he is buried in the Riverside National Cemetery in Riverside, California, Section 8, Site 220D. I never met Sergeant Eugenio, but I was the commanding officer on the scene at that bombing that day and pulled him out along with others of that rhino bus, along with Abdul, our interpreter, who's now in the United States. He was the first one in that vehicle pulling those Americans out as we secured the scene and then we went in as well. It's men like that sergeant, another sergeant, a staff sergeant and a colonel who a couple days later we memorialized on our base, Camp Julian, who give us this beautiful day in this great country. It, he is the reason we are here. He is the reason. <laughs> he did not die in vain. We will need more 29 year olds like Sergeant Eugenio Riverside, California, 
who we never met, and I don't know, he's from the Philippines, totally different background from mine. But you know what he does? He looks up at that flag and reveres it because he understands how special it truly is. America is an exceptional nation because of our values and because of our people and because of our warriors who are willing to defend it. And may we create another generation of warriors ready to stand at the watch and defend this great nation. God bless you all. Thank you so much. about that? Pete, thank you. Impassioned, straightforward. Uh, thank you for bringing the war home to everybody. And it's on us now to fight here to keep our republic. And it can be lost. It can be lost. Thank you, Pete, for bringing that home. Fantastic words. I'd like to invite everyone to stand now as we dedicate this field of flags. Please turn and face the flags. Almighty and everlasting God, your mighty power and grace has been clearly evident in the many and various signs and wonders you've demonstrated throughout the blood-soaked history of this world. We stand in your presence today in quietness and humility before your greatness. To your glory, O oh God, we dedicate this field today to those who've placed freedom for others above their own safety and in the performance of their duties have paid the ultimate price, even their very lives. We dedicate this field as a reminder of the many sacrifices that have been made and will be made to preserve our way of life as a free people under your divine lordship. In your mercy, we pray that you would open the gates of your everlasting kingdom and glory to these brave warriors represented here, and that you bless their families with your store of spiritual comfort, healing, and a peace that passes all understanding. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, the Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to have a 21-gun salute for our field, and I turn it over to the Middletown Police Department.
the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his hand a blessing upon you and give you peace. Through him who died and rose again, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. What a great day, huh? Thank you for being here. Thank you to Jim McElvain, who played taps for us. He played for at his father's funeral. I had to snag him. He showed up today. His father was a fine veteran. Thank you to the Brookdale Concordia Corral. Excellent. Thank you so much. Come on up and say hello, everybody.